question for the survey. Species richness. Well, it doesn't matter what the question is. Uh, imagine that you are server, uh, increasing your, serving, your survey for the variable that has generated this correlogram. What I, how are you going to space your sampling sites and why? Closer units, then the loss of very far units further than the distance of independence. You're going to, I'm sorry. You can space either way. You can study sites that are further, very far away or very close, but then avoid sites that have near medium. And why is that? Because near medium, you would, you would not know how those sites would be. But at least the further the sites, you'd be able to, 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 to make excellent attributes for, for the same. Yeah, I think the whole essence of laying out a design is to make sure that you capture as much variability as possible. Now, that means that if you've got sites that are very close to one another, you're not increasing the variability. So what I would do is to put sites beyond that distance because then you're sure that those sites are as much as possible dissimilar to what you have. It's like, for example, if I set an, a site at one unit and at two units, I'm not adding a lot of dissimilarity. It's like when I know the first one, I know the second to a good extent. So as much as possible, I should go beyond that distance to capture as much variability as possible. That's what I'm saying. In one? Anyone else? Just to add on to that, you also you don't you don't as much as you want to add new variability, you want to confirm that that unit that you're assuming is going to be similar is actually similar. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it may be close to, but it's not exactly the same. So you don't know if you're going to pick up unique species in that point. Mm -hmm. So I would. For whatever bit, whatever the units of distances, I would do it. I wouldn't interval space it. I would do it everywhere. For that scale of analysis? Yeah. So that was what? kilometers, and I would do it at zero, but two, four, six, or whatever. Oh, you're gonna have a continuous survey. Continuous survey. Yes. Like you're gonna invest your limited money collecting neighbors. So that's why I was asking the purpose of because if the purpose is. If you're saying species richness, then yes, I think you run the risk of their related neighbors, but you may still get unique species. Mm. They're related, but they're not exactly the same. Right, right. Well, I can tell, I can, I can see that. But suppose your, your, your goal is to add more information to whatever you have, and you are describing that variable. That variable can be species turnover. That variable can be uh, some difference in species composition. That variable could be species richness or, or population abundance. Doesn't matter what the variable is. Uh, if you see a correlogram like that, and you have additional money to do additional surveys, if you're, if the purpose of your survey is to increase knowledge, would you keep adding more information that are just nearby, or are you going to space them? No, then you'd space them. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Maybe, maybe we can keep finding something in, in the six, I mean uh, near zero, because we don't know. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know if it's similar or dissimilar, so we need to make more effort in this. I don't know, but this is what I think. Well, so you my, my idea is to, to go more on this uh, uh, not, not known mm -hmm. in near zero uh, distance, I mean uh, around six. Mm -hmm. Around six. So that's how you would space your, your new sites. Mm-hmm.
I think to a great extent it also depends on objectives. Because if I'm bioprospecting, or if I'm looking for oil for that case, <laughs> then you don't go very far. If you're looking for a medicinal plant, then you don't waste time this way. You go as close as possible. So your sites must be around uh, the site that you have picked that has maybe the first plant. So again, you don't go very far where things are completely dissimilar. You will not find the oil there or a new plant. That, so the objectives yes. should be the objective. Yeah. That depends on the objective. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, if you want to have more data than the data that's already known, and you do a two-stage sampling, do more of, of uh, targeted sampling around those areas near the unit six, targeted sampling, and then the one that I know with some good predictivity, I will do less sampling. I can do stratified random sampling at those sites and this site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Um, so for those, the participants who took the niche modeling course, if that correlogram is summarizing values up of our environmental predictors, then this gives us a very nice approach. We talked about something like this, a very nice approach to asking, when do two similar points <laughs> represent independent versus dependent samples of the, of the environmental landscape? So that's actually really, really critical in niche modeling applications, because otherwise you might have a ton of close by points because somebody was walking around with a GPS unit. And all you're doing is, in, in effect, replicating the same point artificially. So these, these techniques, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, should be part and parcel of every single niche modeling application we ever do. That wasn't a question, right? <laughs> that wasn't a question. Okay, I didn't talk about that. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, so let's go to interpretation of these correlograms. Uh, that's a pretty typical one. Uh, we're going to discuss and see several of them uh, in, in a short moment. Um, but basically what this means is positive autocorrelation in short distances. Okay? We figure, at, we figure that out. And then there is negative spatial autocorrelation in, at long distances. That's what the actual Morin's eye value is telling me. Uh, another correlogram that's pretty typical for ecological uh, variables is this one. It tells me that there is positive spatial correlation in short distances, but there is one distance, whatever that distance is, uh, in which after that, there's no spatial correlation at all. It's close to zero. And it follows that way for long, long distance. That's also pretty typical for ecological variables. Okay? We're gonna return, that, re return to that in a moment uh, when we start doing the uh, practical uh, hands-on uh, exercise. Well, then someone may ask, how many classes I should have? You should have as many as it's right for your data set, but not more than that. <laughs> it doesn't say me. <laughs> it doesn't say much, <laughs> but uh, it's like asking how many bars you should have in an histogram. I don't know. That depends on how many variables you have, how many sampling sites you have, 
That depends on the extent of your domain. That depends on how detailed you, uh, you want to be to a, distance to, a, to a given distance class. But there is this formula. It came out of the, uh, the histogram literature. And it suggests that you should have the number of classes that is defined by this equation. And this is just a suggestion, has no ecological meaning at all. This is just a starting point. You hit on a topic that's been very frustrating, which is that if I use the default number of classes, I might get a lag of, or a distance of independence of 60 kilometers. But if I follow that formula, sometimes it'll multiply by five, and I'll have 200 or 300. And so I kind of ended up feeling like I could turn it into whatever distance I wanted. Mm -hmm. The distance of independence. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. if I would go back to that niche modeling question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How far apart should I keep my points? Mm -hmm. And I get a di I get answers that range from 60 kilometers to 300 kilometers. What do I do? It's a, you shouldn't have asked the question, but <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, there are several things you can do, and none of them is going to be a final and uh, final answer to the question. Um, conceptually. You should know about the biology of what you are studying to know or can infer what this uh, distance is, what the distance of independence is. So conceptually, if, if we had enough knowledge about the distribution, about the uh, dispersal capacity for that species, we should have kind of hints for that. Uh, in fact, we don't have that hint for any species, no species at all. So we don't have that answer. Also, uh, your definition of the distance class uh, should be a consequence, or you should take into account how, how many pairs of sites fall within each class so that you do not have, at any point, a huge heterogeneity between sites within class. That, that is forbidden at all, for all means. Like you, you can't have this huge dissimilarity. But after that, uh, what, what you should keep in mind is that if you have sufficient pairs within each distance class, I'm going to talk ab about uh, talk about that a little bit more in more detail now. Um, if you have sufficient number of pairs per class and it's relatively homogeneous, you can go as detailed as you can. So as, uh, provided that you keep the number of pairs per class even and relatively large. Um, of course, that only applies to kind of regular sampling in space. So if you have big patches of sampling uh, and they are very far, up, far apart with very empty zones in the middle, it becomes really, really hard to use a correlogram to, to get independent, distance of independence from, from correlogram. So it depends on many variables, and it's almost like a case-by-case case, uh, uh, question. But, but keeping um, distance classes with relatively large number of pairs per class, and even between classes, among classes, that's a, that's a must. OK? Um, so, here is a suggestion for the number of classes you should have, and that's just a suggestion. Uh, there's no reason why it should be more or less than that. And what should be the intervals? Uh, that's also a very important question. 
So suppose you are studying South Africa. One could define the intervals uh, by units of 100 kilometers. So that the first distance class is between 0 and 100. And you can keep doing that for as long as there is South Africa, or as long as the extent of South Africa. On the other hand, someone could do something uh, I think it is smarter, is split distance classes by how the sites are distributed in space, how, where the sampling sites are, in a way that each distance class has similar number of pairs inside each one. So it's kind of a trade-off between uh, a statistical interpretation and ecological interpretation. Um, the ecological interpretation would suggest you to do this, because then each class is comparable uh, geographically with all other classes. However, from the statistical perspective, you should do this to make sure the number of sites that are being compared within each distance class are roughly equivalent. So that you can actually tell that this is twice as much as this one. If you violate this, you can't get even this, because then you will, won't be able to, to get ecological interpretation of this. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, time to explore the consequences of defining uh, uh, geographic distances in a moment. So you guys don't need to feel, uh, if, if, you, if you didn't get exactly what I mean, it's going to show up in your computer soon. Uh, and the problem is, suppose you are comparing a transect. Now, when you are comparing uh, with a, a lag or a distance of one, then you are comparing just the nearest neighbor. When you start comparing units that are two unit, uh, uh, sites that are two units of distance away, you get one less comparison for that lag. And when you start comparing things that are even further away, you get even less comparisons here. So you're going to lose one pair for each leg you increase. And what happens is that sometimes you may get weird, very weird results in your correlogram, especially in the less distance classes, because when you are in a distance of eight, you are only comparing this with this and this with this. There are only two comparisons for that distance class. And of course, with smaller uh, uh, units or smaller, smaller comparisons, a small number of comparisons per distance class, it's kind of random what you get. So it doesn't mean anything. We're going to work on this uh, in a moment. So here is the distance class, and here is, Moren here is Moren's eye. This, this uh, Moren's eye in blue, what you are watching here, is uh, a Moren's eye value for, uh, in which each distance class has relatively the same number of pairs. And here, what you are watching is a Moren's eye in which the distance to the other Moren's eye are the same, but most likely you have way less sites being compared here. And that gives this weird, very weird uh, uh, comparison or, or Moren's eye value in, dist in long distance classes. It's like things are very, very similar when they are close and very, very similar when they are like one world away. It doesn't mean much. And in fact, for that same example, the number of uh, connections or the number of sampling sites for each distance class shown in blue is relatively even. So that Moran's eye value is pretty uh, easy to interpret. They, they mean they can be compared. But the number of sites that are being compared within each class in the red Moran's eye or in the red correlogram 
falls to almost nothing in the long distance classes. So here, what you are comparing is just two or three sites that are that distant away, that distant distance away. Okay? Um, so what does this mean? This is statistical, statistical randomness. So if you don't have a very good number of sites being compared here, this is random. This doesn't mean much. You have to watch for this uh, unexpected behavior uh, in less distance classes of uh, correlograms. Okay? So now let's look at some correlograms. So this is bird richness uh, in, uh, in the new world. And what does this correlogram tell us? And what's the relationship between the correlogram and the map? I want volunteers. Hmm? 